Paul, I would like to uh, express my thanks and appreciation to the organizers, the uh, Japan Economic Forum and the BIDS, Philippine Institute of Development Studies. They are all uh, our uh, Singapore Institute of International Affairs close partners. Now, um, <coughs> the topic uh, I respond in my PowerPoint and Dr. And based also on Dr. Joseph Yap uh, guideline, no more than 10 minutes. So uh, I can do it, it's manageable. It, 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 in terms of pages, there are a lot of it, but it's uh, in terms of points, there are about three or four points. But basically, I respond exactly precisely what the prepare question, questions have been mentioned. First of all, the um, people, the first uh, session to the impact of rapid technology on economics and trade. And where is the, the, the point to change this one? Is it this one, right? Okay. Um, so the, uh, I mentioned that the, uh, the virtue and benefits of the, the previous, uh, by the way, the previous speakers all mentioned it about the uh, uh, the income disparities and the uh, uh, popularism, all these things. They are all correct because it's a multifaceted. You know, this phenomenon is not just uh, in certain region or in certain country. It's widespread all across borders. So therefore, I'm bringing in another perspective of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the virtue and benefits of international divisions of labor and international trade is premised on economic principles of competitive advantage. So, <clears throat> the basic fact is that the trading nations have different political, cultural, and social structures and characteristics and they react differently to changes in technology, especially rapid and te digital technologies. The policy of how to respond uh, to technological change all the same. But how policymakers, politicians, government re respond to it differ across, even of the same political system. Because why? It's a cultural, social characteristics are not taken into account. Uh, some are more dynamic. Some political systems and culture are more adaptable to rap rapid changes in technology. The rise of protectionism, anti-globalization, and intense nationalism could be the result of this disequilibrium between the rate of change in technology and the rate of change in political and social system among different trading countries. Changes in political and social system are very slow, way behind changes in technology. So, resulting to different economic benefits accruing to different countries and to causing widening income disparity internationally, domestically. And again, I remind you, this is not the only factors. There are many other factors. But one factor we have to take into account is that technology is a neutral value. But social, cultural, political systems are value-loaded. Okay, different countries, even democratic system, not to say countries that have no free election. Even the same, they react differently because the governance system if you uh, adopt the same policy, but uh, you do not, uh, even the right policy, if you don't impl uh, implement it on the right time, it becomes counterproductive, boomerang. So because of rapid changes, and that <coughs> makes it worse, doubly difficult for countries uh, because of different cultural social system that exist in the world today. To counter negative side effects of rapid digital technology and globalization, there must exist a workable regional and bilateral system, which I mentioned it uh, just now, uh, to promote economic and technical cooperation for human and physical capacity building and special differential treatment in developing and in trade deficit countries funded mainly by countries that have persisted huge trade surpluses. As it is now, <coughs> multilateral system is too diffuse, to disperse. The benefit and cost are not focused, are not so uh, targeted. So, also I mentioned it, bilaterally, 
Japan and others, you know, Korea, uh, uh, Singapore has a lot of uh, uh, bilateral uh, uh, trade facilitation and in uh, CMLB country, the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam all. We have, uh, Singapore has spent uh, for the last five years, $178 million, Singapore dollars. But these are all bilateral. So I think this needs to be upgraded into more bilateral, embedded into the framework. Because by itself, because of rapid technology, innovation, and all this, this is uh, across borders. It cannot be done bilaterally. It cannot be done also multilaterally. It too diffuse. Africa has a different one, Latin America has a different one, and Europe has a different one. So it needs to be fashioned and designed in a regional framework. Of course, APEC has that ECOTEC facilitation, and this has to be more binding, not like APEC uh, on a voluntary basis. So another thing that I mentioned is here is the trade surplus countries must set up the fund more contributing to it. So then it's not only just trade liberalization, market access, but but uh, capacity building is so important. Not one country can do it. It must be done regionally. Together, we must create the platform, the framework to, to channel out it. This in order to mitigate uh, trade liberalization, in order to mitigate the technological rapid changes that have been going on, and also to minimize and to neutralize some of the difference in social cultural value. The most of multilateral partnership for human capital development among countries in the region. Well, this is the second question that was prepared by, uh, by the organizer. The Asia Pacific APEC, uh, the ECOTEC, which is one of the main pillars of APEC since establishment in 89. But this is all uh, is a voluntary and non binding. And also, not very much. I checked with the APEC Secretariat in Singapore. It's, uh, it's, it's not uh, sustainable. Because only a few countries putting up the money there. And also, it's not on, on a regular budget basis. It's on uh, cyclical. Okay, the US, Australia, Canada, or, uh, Singapore also put it in, and New Zealand. The rest are all not contributing. So you need a more binding and more sustainable amount to help out the trade facilitation and capacity building. It has done a lot of economic and technical cooperation among APEC members, especially on trade and investment policy issues, and technical assistance extended to developing APEC members. On bilateral framework, JICA, Japan, Singapore has established, I have done capacity building in all in Yangon, in Phnom Penh, in, uh, in Laos, in uh, Vientiane, and in uh, Hanoi. They are all spent, and it is a permanent basis, but I told the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that you're spending a lot of money, $178 million within five years, and they're putting up another $100 million for another five-year project. But it must be done because the reason why, if we put it in the ASEAN Secretariat, there's nobody coordinating it many. So therefore, we need to set up a framework whereby a regional so the benefit would be both multiplied and uh, minimize the rapid technological change across borders. For example, uh, this one all done already. Many countries in the region have been recipient and beneficiary of human capital, ADP. But this is, a, 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 what they call it, is a, a more in, a multilateral. So I think the ADB one and all these things, so, so the ASEANs, the RCEP, and the uh, 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 trade liberalization, and as Professor Tang Yong Lee mentioned it, that it has to be more cooperative development system. So, what co connectivity issue prevent the formation of a people center ASEAN? Geographically, ASEAN member states are not connected because of physical barrier as well as languages, social and cultural diversity. I mentioned it in one of the chapters of contributing, like Dr. Bonciano Intel is the coordinator. I mentioned it that ASEAN has done a lot. The reason we don't cut each other throat, we don't go into war in a, like in the Middle East. This is a great achievement, so the resources can be diverted into economic and industrial development. Okay. So, but in addition to it, that uh, we, have, we have to be uh, more patient because we are so different. Some are uh, even mo uh, Muslim countries. Uh, between Malaysia and Indonesia, they are very different. 
okay, some Catholic countries, some Buddhist countries, all these are very different cultural, social value that we have to be patient, but we are moving in the right direction. I think ASEAN has done a great job in, 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 in our regional law. But of course, you cannot use the benchmark of the European countries. Within five years, you can do it. We agree five years, just give and take another three, four years, but we will get there. It takes time and persistent effort to move towards ASEAN community based on people-centered framework. The benefit of ASEAN cooperation and integration have not trickled down to the vast majority of the ASEAN people. It's not because of the policy was wrong. It's just simply the governance and the ASEAN secretariat is weak. It is the general post office. It is the it's a GPO. It's not, it doesn't have empower. Delegating is not giving them power, but empowering them to monitor, to implement policy. The policy are correct except that it is not implemented as so as a result, the trickle-down effects are not good. The promotion of e-commerce and uh, 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 micro, social, uh, small, medium enterprise, enterprise, physical and human connected would accelerate people, center ASEAN, as well as measure to combat natural disaster, social, economical, to increase the empathy, increase the cultural awareness, and increase the sensitivity that these 10 ASEAN countries, they are our brothers and our sisters. So that would be people-centered. It's not only just a, 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 a blank, a, a abstract concept, but you must be translated into something. Okay? So we are all brothers and sisters in the region. Uh, states uh, through narrowing development gap, so it's not only just in words of one of the three principles of the ASEAN economic community, but it must be in real capacity building, training that. In all the three, uh, the five ASEAN CMLB countries, the Singapore training, every day there is a training on port management, on the central banking, on uh, everything they need, they need to know. And that's what it is down, down to the wire, practical, pragmatic, what they need. Not so much of money giving it to them, but it is something that they need to do and do it in time. Now, uh, so the uh, must be upgraded and empowered to monitor and assess commonly agreed policy implementation. This is what it means, people center. If people center, it must be translated into practical policy. Mean ASEAN Secretary must be empowered must be delegated a certain thing that needs to be done, what we have a great common. So because the time is up here, so I would not go into the RCEP and DPP because it's all very clear, everybody knows about it, so there's not much uh, value added that I can add into it. Uh, okay, so um, but this is e-commerce, it's also all everybody knows, uh, I just add into it, you know, because uh, in the question they need, what strategic measures in order to promote uh, the uh, RCEP. I think Professor Chang Yun Ling and a few others have already uh, 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 have already mentioned, so I won't go into it. Um, okay, so I just add here, uh, uh, thank you again very much to share my uh, points.